Ma'am, we are on live, ma'am, and we are starting session. Sure. So, very good evening, doctors and Dr. Stalin and BF of uh, Shield Healthcare. Welcoming you all for the today's uh, webinar on uh, poor ovarian reserve. I welcome the delegates. I request them to post their queries in the chat box, if any, so that we can have a short QA session at the end of this presentation. It's time to introduce our invited speaker for the Dr. Uh, Lavanya Kiran, ma'am. Madam has uh, completed her MBBS and MS OBG and a diploma from Germany, fellow, uh, fellow in reproductive medicine from uh, Rahul Gandhi University of Health Sciences. And uh, Madam is currently the consultant, uh, obstetrician, reproductive medicine, robotic surgeon. Madam is associated with uh, Cloud9 Hospitals, Bangalore. And Madam is also the visiting surgeon at Narayana Health Hospital. Uh, Madam is associated with various uh, societies and Madam is currently the secretary of uh, yeah, KISAR 2021-2023. Uh, and Madam was also the joint secretary of KISAR, founder member of Karnataka chapter IFS, member of uh, ACE, member of uh, BSOG. And uh, Madam has also received various uh, credits and awards to her service. And uh, I could uh, name few like uh, Madam has received the Woman Healthcare Leader in Obstetrician by Asia GCC, and Madam has also received the Foxy Award winner for the contribution of OBGN. And Madam is also the invited speaker by Taiwan Ministry of Exchange Program in OBG. And uh, with this short introduction, I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, your, your resume is so big, I, I would like to make it short and I welcome you, ma'am. I'm handing session to you for uh, further presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Stalin, for this uh, kind introduction. So without any delay, I think we should uh, move forward with our talk. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Just give me a moment. I, are you getting the this thing? Uh, no, ma'am. We're not sharing. Oh, one minute. At the offset, I think uh, even before I start my uh, slides, I think I would like to uh, thank Shield for this wonderful uh, academic platform that we have you have given us. And uh, the best thing about I think in COVID that we have learned is to connect online and continue our academic sessions and. Um, you have always been a support to us, Shield. Thank you so much. And uh, to all the delegates who have logged in, I think very controversial, but very important topic, because this is something in the present clinical scenario that we are seeing in higher number these days. And uh, thus is my topic, the poor ovarian reserve. Like I mentioned, I would always say that POR is a poor prognostic factor in ART. That's only because we all know that the decline in the quality and quantity of the oocytes will always be there. Unfortunately, we all know that it's an irreversible change that a woman has to go through this. And uh, especially because of the ovarian stimulation protocol that is happening, not only in ERT clinics, but everybody practicing ovulation stimulation. This is a decline even before they reach the fertility clinics different protocols that is happening and of course there are a lot of other factors added on to this and that is one of the age criteria which is very well known and it's a known contribution factor for poor ovarian reserve here though the probability and the prognostic factor in the fertility treatment is not known but then because of the age there is an abnormal vascularization happening we know that the oxidative stress which is there this free radical imbalance which happens Toxic and genetic changes are always there and these are the ones which are contributing to the decline in the oocyte quality which translates into abnormal fertilization and hence leading into a reduced implantation happening and hence giving the fertility specialist a lesser results. And we also know that uh, little is known about it. The management is very tricky here. Results are very poor. We also have genetic factors contributing to it. And to make it worse, we also have the environmental factors getting added onto this. And more of the times that we start stimulation in these poor ovarian responders, higher cancellation rates have been there. Though we get few oocytes, 
getting them into an embryo or a blast is very difficult and uh, lower pregnancy rates, I would say. And here, approximately, it is believed that 10% of them undergoing IVF do show poor ovarian response to any of the gonadotrophin stimulation that keeps ha happening. And then uh, that's only because of the quality and the quantity of the oocyte pool or the follicle pool that is there. And it is much more in the infertile group, I would say. And these are the ones which is complicating our results. And it is very difficult to even understand whom are, who, who are we dealing with, who are the poor response people. Here, as per the definition, if I have to say, poor ovarian response implies a suboptimal follicular response, which means there are lesser number of oocytes retrieved during a stimulation of an IVF. According to the ESHRAE, it defines, according to the Bologna criteria, in order to standardize the definition, since the variability is like very striking and it can be different. As per the Bologna criteria, we define that at least two of the following three criteria. What are they? When the female is more than 40 years of age, she's one of the risk factors. Here, either if she has lesser number of, uh, less than three number of oocytes for a conventional protocol where we expect at least anywhere six to eight number of oocytes, but then we end up having only three or even lesser number of oocytes, then she falls into a poor ovarian response or she has a lesser number of antral follicle count, which is less than five, including both the ovaries or the AMH is less than 1.1 nanograms per ml. We can see that the prevalence, uh, like, you know, we Indians, though we have high number of data, higher population rates, but then on the scientific note, we don't have good data. This is one of the studies that I picked it up from the US where the prevalence says is 19 to 26%. And um, FSH has been very high in people, even though they're lesser than 40 years. There's another study from the China population uh, where they say the prevalence is almost 16.9, where they have taken a cutoff of 2.5. And even I think even in my clinical practice, uh, it's better all of us take 2.5 nanograms per ml as the uh, cutoff value to label anybody uh, as a low AMH. Here, we also have to see that two episodes of POR after maximal stimulation is sufficient enough to label. So sometimes when we do a first stimulation and we get poor response, and we can always try and change the protocol where we can use a dual stimulation protocols. I'll tell you about the protocols that we can use to make sure that we have a better results in the next cycle. Even in the second time, if we have a poor response, I think that's good enough for us to call her as the poor ovarian responder. Coming to the age, it's a mathematical model which is proposed where they're seeing that this is a, uh, in fact, we all come with a fixed number of uh, primordial follicles where as per the age, the number of primordial follicles starts reducing and that is what leads into lesser number of oocyte quality and the quantity and that is why it's difficult for these people and we can see with the advance in age, the account comes down. So we all know that there are around 7 lakhs of oocytes which is there when the fetus is around 5 months and as soon as you're about to deliver that's around the ninth month it reduces to 5 million and during puberty it is only 1 million and of which only 400 ovulate of course the peak of the fertility is somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, 30 years and after 30 years there's a high peak of fall in the fertility and there are also predictions that higher the age, lesser the live birth rates and lesser the response. And we have enough of charts to tell us that number of embryos that we will be obtaining with the increased age is also much lesser and the number of oocytes is much lesser. We can see that the number of blastocysts, the euploidy blastocysts that we obtain is also lesser. So they, we, they say the probability of blastocysts being euploid declines with age. That means having a aneuploidy embryos will be higher with the increase in age. So younger the age, we have better number of uh, embryos and better quality of embryos for transfer. So uh, this is exactly what I mentioned. These are the studies supporting that uh, with the increase in age, the aneuploidies are much more higher. So it is only going to be progressive. This is the contribution of the age. But that is something that we cannot do about it. And the same goes with the genetic as well. But coming to uh, environmental factors, we already know that the plasticides that is around us because of the BPA that is used, 
the exposure of pesticides that is there in the general environment we they even the fetuses are exposed with lot of ingestion by the mother the fruits the vegetables the environment the air quality everything becomes a contributing factor and these can deteriorate the if it's a female fetus it's already coming it's can can be start reducing and it causes a lot of problems including your weight also has a contribution to this where underweight overweight can be a problem even nutrition is a greater contribution to the poor ovarian reserve as well of course ethnicity and economic factors is very important economy uh, education also plays a important role because you know that higher the age you are prone to all these problems including down syndrome so you go for a screening much earlier and you will reach out to the fertility clinic as well cigarette smoking is one of a very dangerous thing because we know that the nicotine increases or increases the uh, problems where the vascularity is reduced and the mutations do happen where they are exposed and they also block the estrogen receptors when the estrogen receptors are blocked then the genomic pathway totally changes and the cascade also changes leading into higher degeneration of the oocytes that will be formed so the other causes are idiopathic chemotherapy idiopathic can be like where you uh, ended up with uh, some surgery endometriosis where you should know where not to intervene unnecessarily and where to stop especially in uh, cases like endometriosis so these all can be an idiopathic factor or sometimes is an addition you try to do a cyst removal or you have to try to do the uh, adesolysis all these things can cause a little loss in the normal ovarian tissue as well of course chemotherapy and radiotherapy has a main role to play and this is where fertility preservation uh, plays a important role where we can definitely preserve the oocytes well in advance in order to make sure post therapy because now the therapies are so good that the survival rate and their recovery is also good that we can definitely go in for a transfer for her at much later rate and genetic mutations are common smoking like i already mentioned ovarian surgeries like endometriosis i mentioned autoimmune responses the mums galactosemia tubal surgery are all one of the major contributions here the ovarian reserve is used to describe the reproductive potential of any women where the quality and the quantity of the oocytes matter here ovarian reserve test can be done where we detect the life span reproductive life span basically where we know how to optimize and individualize the protocols that we will be leading in order to get a good pregnancy rates is what is very important so coming to the ovarian test what are the tests that we could be using we could be using a biochemical proactive and sonographic images where fsh amh and uh, inhibin can be done e2 can be checked the cc uh, challenge test can be done and very important to assess the anthral follicle count which is very very important coming to the basal fsh here it is important that you do it in the early phase of your uh, periods best to be done on the second or the third day where we show we see that the adequate quantity of the ovarian hormones in early follicular phase is seen which helps in the fsh maintenance of a normal range of course this is an inter and intra cycle variability is uh, very high so this is why i said needs to be done in the initial part of the uh, cycles and when combined with estradiol the sensitivity and the specificity of the basal fsh will be much better it can vary anywhere between 45 to 100% and however the sensitivity is low from 11 to 86% here the fsh cut off is taken as 25 but now i think we should better take it as a 10 international units to detect the poor ovarian response and which leads to higher chances of failure would be better to take a cut off of uh, 10 international units coming to the estradiol it's better to keep the values less than 50 i would say though it is if it's more than 60 picograms this means that the high chance of cycle cancellation will be there and um, another very important and uh, the new kid on the block or maybe it's already proven itself the anti mullerian hormone the amh testing where the amh is secreted from early follicular stage where follicle sizes less than 6 mm is also contributing to the amh uh, values here uh the changes between the cycle is not much so you could do it any time in the cycle and we need to remember if the amh is much lower uh that means 
she has a poor ovarian reserve and it is one of the sensitive biomarker but the only problem with this amh is it is not standardized in every lab so reliability sometimes become a question itself but anthel follicle is something that people who are trained in scan on an eyeballing make sure that an anthel follicle count is done and best to be done between the second and the fourth day and you have to take combined on both the ovaries uh, what is the anthel follicle count which is there and it will help us predict where again the sensitivity is between 7 and 34 and uh, predicting uh, the pr pregnancy predictor values is high between 64 and 98% and it of course depends on the cycle time because if you're doing it post follicle post ovulation then the uh, number of follicles seen can be vary so it is better be, to be done when the ovary is quiescent that is between the second and the fourth cycle fourth day of the cycle where there is no cyst so that is how you detect and a minimum we say at least four to five follicles have to be there if anything lesser than four or five follicles then we label it as a low uh, anthel follicle count like i said fsh if it is more than 10 it is uh, again poor ovarian responder amh less than 2.5 is a poor ovarian resp uh, responder and we can make a chart in this comparison where we know the sensitivity and the response of the people of how Uh, she will be uh, knowing, and if people are trained in Doppler or you have a facility of the scan and you have a sonologist to help you out, better to check the volume and the blood flow, which will also tell us. Though it is not a very uh, sensitive test, but then definitely it can be used. Now, if you ask me which one is the best, I would say I rely definitely with the AMH and FSH, and of course the anthel follicle is also one of the important factors which can be used, which will help us. to tell us are we dealing with the poor ovarian responders and uh, this is how we do the test and uh, these are the uh, studies which are also telling that it is good to go ahead and do the testing uh, depending on these values the iatrogenic causes like i mentioned cystectomy hysterectomies all these things for inevitable reasons like endometriosis or adenomyosis or adenocarcinomas they are dealing with cancer patients we can do a ovarian preservation first itself and then go ahead with the hysterectomy and of course we can use it to use it in a surrogate and now the laws are always already there ert so all of you please follow the guidelines that is given and uh, register your clinics and the ert banks needs to be registered and the other thing is the laparoscopic ovarian drilling please don't overdo anything where you need to understand not more than four punches needs to be done in each ovary only if the volume is more then you can go for five or six pricks but otherwise it's not an indication at all to do more than four uh, pricks because then you could again be leading her into a lower amh and poor responder and that becomes an iatrogenic cause where the ovarian reserve is diminishing this is what i was talking about social egg freezing it is the race against time or it's a just a mirror or smoke very difficult but then of course uh if somebody indicated i would say better to do it for ethical reasons like i said cancer patients or for some inevitable reasons you are not married and uh, you are delaying it for a therapy then yes definitely encourageable but uh, social freezing will definitely take a uh, different leap altogether with the art laws coming in place and the problem with the poor ovarian responder is that we do have lot of guidelines and lot of ways to handle it but the subclinical por patients who can benefit from particular medications is very important here we have the posidion classification of art where unexpected inappropriate ovarian response happens we need to categorize them depending on the age the markers like the anthel follicle count amh and their response to a stimulation which has happened before if somebody has had a cycle stimulation before and if their age is uh, less than 35 years and they have an anthel follicle more than 5 and amh is more than 1.2 then they all fall in the category 1 if the age is 35 with the same parameters of afc being 5 and amh being more than 1.2 they all fall in the category of 2 and they should have got good number of oocytes where it is 4 to 9 number of oocytes that is excellent they fall into the category of 3 where if they are less than 35 their amh is very low of 1.2 their anthel follicle is 2 then they fall into category of 3 
If they are an older patient of 35, then it comes to uh, category four. And this helps us predict that and also counsel our patients that are they falling in a uh, poor responder and how could the results be. So in order to increase our results, we can use higher doses of gonadotrophin or use a natural cycle where you can modify a little bit and add some medications just for the trigger and uh, priming of the estrogen can be done. Supplement of LH can be done. Luteal antagonists can be used. Letrozole is a co-treatment. And of course, uh, adjuvants like androgens, and I, I don't use growth hormones, but then can definitely be tried, but it's very expensive. Melatonin, aspiration, uh, aspirin, and uh, oocyte donor and assisted hatching. Assisted hatching is definitely going to help be helpful. But then we need to remember, like I mentioned, if age is another additional factor, the number of blastocysts that we're going to have at the end of the day can be very lesser. Aneuploidy, embryos are going to be higher. That means the euploid embryos are going to be much lesser with higher age, and that can be a risk factor. Oocyte donors, yes, can be one of the options, but it's very difficult. And like I mentioned, whenever you, with the new law, if you're going for a oocyte donor, you need to remember you cannot have more than six oocytes. So you cannot have uh, OHSs or you cannot have more than uh, six oocytes and your results are going to come down. And of course, the secret... Um, protocol that you're going to be using to get only six number of oocytes is going to be very tricky. And imagine if you get six number of oocytes, what is the number of embryos or the blastocysts that you're going to have at the end of the day can be very tricky to be using and not easy for the to convince the patients as well, because we see in our clinic where patients, though they have an AMH of 1.8 and we tell them, look, you're a candidate for oocyte donor. It's not easy to convince the patients. Of course, if you are putting them, we have uh, different protocols like short agonist, microdose flare, we can be used. Antagonist protocols can be used. Natural cycle is best and modified natural cycle. Like I said, small doses of SH, FSH can be used. Antagonist can be used. Minimal stimulation protocols like letrozole and uh, CC can be added. Priming or pre-treatment with OC pill. And DHEA is something that is very important along with aspirin and leucine. All these things can definitely be tried. And these are the markers that we told about adjuvant therapy and the gonadotrophin triggers that can be used. Luteal phase is very important. In non-responders, of course, we can use the ANTAC, the recombinant FSH, the GNHR, GNRH agonist triggers, the HCG can be used. We have several protocols to be used, but then the problem is when the patient is not responding, that is when we are going to have a problem and explaining it to the patient becomes very, very difficult. There have been cycles where uh, they have seen when recombinant FSH is used, the number of dosages used in these patients will be much lower when compared to a urinary or a highly purified HM, uh, HMG used for these patients. They can be needing a higher number of dosages. So individualization of non posidian uh, patients is not very difficult. You have to uh, you can use a recombinant FSH, which is of a better safety protocols where you're reducing number of OHSs and HCG triggers can definitely be used. But for the classical poor responder, what are the things that you can do? Like I mentioned, I told you already about the factors, if considering their age, considering the number of oocytes that they have had in the previous cycle, if they've had an FSA, AFC and an AMH much lower, what kind of uh, treatment do you use? So you can use a higher number of FSH, which can be used for stimulation protocols. And you can also use the proposed uh, markers that can be used where the follicle to oocyte index can be seen where oocyte number by the number of oocytes that is obtained by the antral follicle count that we have. So if it is less than 0.5, that means it's a low follicle to oocyte index and our results are going to be very low. And uh, hence population investigated, we have seen that hyper response to recommended uh, recombinant FSH is a better treatment. Advanced reproductive age group co-treatment with antagonist is better. And uh, we will have better live birth rates, number of oocytes retrieved, implantation rates, fertilization rates will definitely be better. And uh, these are the protocols where you can start with 150 or you can go even as high as uh, uh, 225 to 300 to start off and then you can start tapering it down if there's a better response. 
and um, these are all uh, the gonadotrophins that we can use using the follicle to oocyte index where i told you, you know the number of oocytes that you achieved compared to the antral follicle count and the type of uh, fsh that is used the lh supplementations and to individualize the posidian gr gr group 3 and 4 where the age is more than 35 and they have much lesser response so here you can use long agonist protocols gnrh antagonist dual stimulation is something that you can be using so dual stimulation means you start a protocol you retrieve the number of oocytes give a gap of couple of days maybe four or five days and then you can restart the stimulation immediately so you have more number of oocytes and this uh, uh, criteria is depending on the primordial follicles which grows in stage by stage and so you don't miss out the smaller follicles which will start growing at a much later date and you are get, going to get a good number of oocytes so you can do a oocyte pooling and then finally uh, fertilize and then you are going to have a better number of uh, embryos and they have seen compared to uh, one time if you have eight percent they have seen it increases to almost 17 percent when you do a dual stimulation protocols and the results are definitely much better and like i mentioned uh, agonist antagonist can all be combined High dose gonadotrophins may not benefit the patient beyond a particular dose and also increase the possibility of poor oocyte quality and discomfort and side effects and costing is very important. Two protocols resulted in a similar implantation rate where antagonists used in more patient friendly and decreased the number of days of gonadotrophin stimulation despite the use of uh, short and ultra short for protocols which is not published. They have a better benefit in the clinical outcomes. We can definitely add letrozole and CC for poor uh, ovarian responders where we can see the response become a little more uh, better uh, uh, and we have a better live birth rates. Coming to the adjuvants that can be added, DHEA is something very important and it has definitely worked in my practice and I would say it increases the conception rate and estradiol priming can be done, recombinant LH can add be added and they have seen that almost 30% uh, better in poor responders growth hormones like i already mentioned i don't use it melatonin aspirin yes definitely but it leads into a debate of topic by itself like i mentioned oocyte accumulation can be done where by vitrification followed by insemination which leads into a better success rate in lower responders just double uh, double stimulation like i mentioned you start the trigger uh, use uh, start the stimulation protocols aspirate and restart in a couple of days this is to have the multiple recruitment waves of the follicles and you have the opportunity to utilize the ovarian stimulation in the luteal phase as well and uh, both follicular and this thing like i mentioned oocyte donor is not going to be easy going forward but that is definitely to be kept as a resort and be very careful when you start going for an uh, egg donation and the donor that you're going to be using and all these people need to be coming only from the ART bank as per the new ART guidelines and uh, newer but yet established approach I would say ovarian transplantation mitochondria stem cell based neogenesis uh, of lately my favorite the platelet rich plasma which can be uh, drawn from the blood and I'm also started using the stem cell where we all know that the platelet rich plasma is like a growth factor and cytokines and has been used as an agent to induce the tissue generation from years together in different fields like cosmetology, uh, orthopedics, all these people have been using and the same has been implemented in the ovaries as well in poor responders and perimenopausal age groups, even the menopausal age groups to make the symptoms much better. PRP also promotes follicular development in vitro and has been utilized in small cases and uh, they have shown that intra ovarian injection of PRP has led into increased number of oocytes and I hope I will be able to publish a study very soon where we've had a couple of pregnancies with AMH as low as 0 0.4 and 0 0.8 following a platelet rich plasma from the stem cell bone marrow extract that we have used and a lot of PRPs that has been used so it's on the way to publication and I'll also be presenting on an international conference very soon maybe we can take that as a topic um, at the earliest so in, uh, in the same uh, to support uh, the study another fertile sterile in 2020 also suggests that the intraovarian injection of autologous prp might be considered in women with poor ovarian response to stimulation 
where wider clinical application can be needed but a uh, lot of randomized studies needs to be uh, still uh, upcoming but then it is very well proven and i have also like used it in my practice and it's good so coming to antioxidant supplementation impact of the antioxidant supplementation where we have the oocyte ivf media for oocyte collection fertilization has been added and supplements in 8 to 12 weeks prior to ivf cycles has led into better quality of uh, embryos better quality of oocytes that is uh, Uh, obtained and good number of euploid blastocysts are seen and the supplements that can be used is n acetyl cysteine melatonin vitamin e c this is a innumerable uh, list l carnitine myoinositol folic acid coq10 pentoxyphylin vitamin d but the one that i like is the lucin and um, that is only because it is scientifically proven and it acts on the mtor signaling where we can see that the protein synthesis is better and the energy production is much better where the keto glucurate conversion to glutamate is very important and that is how we end up having a better primordial follicle which leads into better uh, quality of oocytes and uh, mtor has been very promising where the lucin metabolism happens and we can see that the amh and fsh are much better after using lucin for a longer duration of time where at least 3 months prior you need to start before your uh, stimulation protocols and amh recruit role in recruitment of the primordial follicles will be better and if not if you have a lesser amh we know that the primordial follicle pool will be lesser and in turn leading into a lesser quality so uh, lucin i think has got good results and we have enough of studies to prove that lucin when it is added into Uh, poor responders they have a better uh, number of m2s which is obtained in the quality and the p values also have been better and the cleavage rates are better and the grades of uh, embryos that obtained is also much better so adding uh, at least 3 months well in advance is most important so before i conclude we are yet to reach a consensus and conclusion about their app definition and management patient counseling and protocol personalization are the key to optimize reproductive outcomes women with poor ovarian response should be appropriately counseled they should be told that despite of your lucin your prps your stem cell your uh, protocols recombinant adding a recombinant lh you're adding the letrozol you're adding a clomiphene you have to counsel her we can have a poor response and the number of embryos that we are going to have the number of euploid blastocysts that we are going to have and the number of embryos that will be left to transfer if you are waiting for a blastocyst can vary and counseling becomes very important so that the patient is prepared and also the option of oocyte donor should always be discussed so that patient makes a informed decision and an informed consent is always there of course we have to go as an aggressive approach to achieve the pregnancy before it's too late thank you i hope uh, the session has been useful thank you shield for this uh, wonderful opportunity thank you ma'am thank you very much for that uh, another informative session ma'am uh, ma'am uh, let me wait for not 2 minutes for the participants to post their queries ma'am definitely ma'am i and i have personally two questions from my end ma'am like uh, you are uh, uh, speaking about this uh, platelet uh, prp ma'am platelet so ma'am uh, whether it can increase the amh level definitely the- so uh, stalin dr stalin what we have seen is in my practice there has not been much of a reflection on an amh value but then the quality of the oocytes that we have obtained see to be very frank the two pregnancy that i said i have it's on a way of publication where we had amh uh, of 0.4 and 0.8 and uh, this is when newly i started doing the prp bone marrow uh, aspiration and using the platelet which is obtained we have done this i don't think anybody would have a courage even telling people that look you can try your own gametes and any patient they are mostly always willing to go for their own gametes because it's not easy to convince our patients to say let's go for a oocyte donor then the patient insisted i said look let's try this for you before we go for your stimulation protocols for both the patients where we had 0.4 and 0.8 i got two sites of which only one embryo each and both of them conceived and i think that's a wonderful thing so we've been having lot of other this thing but uh, over i've been practicing this over 6 months i'm not seen a grass drastic change in the amh values where a 
changes happen point from point four to point six or point eight to point one something like that a slight change in the amh values but then definitely the quality of the oocytes have been better another two patients whom we had done ivf before the quality was pathetic i would say post the prp and the stem cell we've had four oocytes but then the qualities are much better the m2 that we have obtained is definitely better so more than a reflection on amh which can be a little longer duration later but then the quality of the oocytes is definitely promising Uh, ma'am, what will be the ideal time for using this PRP, ma'am, and when when it has to be used? So I would definitely say within ten to fifteen days is the best time. Very early, very difficult because I have tried doing laparoscopic and uh, ultrasound uh, guided. Laparoscopy, when we are doing, what happens? It's easy. So you are actually physically inside, so it's easy to catch your ovaries and inject. Not a problem. You can do it. But then doing it under ultrasound, you need to understand who are these people who are poor responders, where the ovaries are already shrunk, so your AMH is low, so your vascularity is much lower. So the slipping of the ovaries is very difficult. So I always, any surgery wise, like laparoscopy, we are doing. I always say within twelfth day. But then if I'm doing it ultrasound, I really don't mind doing between ten and fifteenth day, because some follicle starts growing by itself. so you your accessibility can be better but definitely the follicular phase would be a better time to do okay ma'am we have one more question ma'am like uh, when they are using this uh, gnrh agonist protocol there is a formation of cyst in this uh, poor ovary and responders ma'am so what could be the reason for that formation of cyst i don't think because of agonist that you should be ending up having a cyst you need to start your agonist in the luteal phase of the previous cycle So unlikely, but then if you see that this is do your E two. If the E two is less than fifty, then I don't think you should be worried at all. Or if you still don't want to go ahead, what you can do is you can do the cyst aspiration and start the stimulation protocol on the same day of aspiration. These are the three different things that you can do. But then if you've already observed that there is a cyst, what you can do is give a OC pill the previous uh, cycle and then start off. And I don't think it should be a problem at all. Ma'am, uh, what are the side effects or of this PRP treatment? Ma'am, any anaphylaxis reactions? Right, it's an autologous uh, PRP that it has been used. So right now, not you. Uh, no, I have not at least. I think we've finished almost around fifty-five cases as of now. But then Tacho not had any complication. But then of course, small abscess, hematomas, infections can always be there. This is why you need to be trained, and uh, it's almost like our egg pickup that we are doing. We're using the same needle. So where you hit, especially because I said your ovaries can be slipping, so you can hit a vessel which leads into hematoma, and uh, of course the OT environment, all these things, infections can be more. All these things needs to be watched out, and I think aseptic precautions following or will be taken care. So these do come in the bracket. Ah, uh, ma'am. Uh comparing these four uh, groups ma'am that we have discussed in this poseidon so who has to be which group of uh, people has to be uh, given more importance or or uh, like for when for this prp treatment ma'am so whether uh, any side effects in any particular group age group or any other group ma'am? i don't think so i think everybody becomes a very important uh, group i think because at the end of the day it's like you need a yeah, response baby. Yeah. So and everywhere we have to see that here uh, three and four becomes more important because their AMH is much lower. We have seen our practice, like I said, it's so difficult to convince a patient that they have to go for their own stimulation protocol, go for a oocyte donor, so they insist on going through their protocol. One and two, sometimes you do end up getting some uh, follicles, and so many times people are not willing for IVF. Also, they do consider three and four becomes very problematic, and they become a higher uh, modality where you can treat them. Okay, ma'am. There are many positive comments. Like it was a useful webinar in the chat box, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes. And I think adding the uh, adjuvants like leucine and all will definitely be very important. Though yes. I do PRP, I don't. Uh, adjuvant C is a very controversial topic or a topic per se by itself, where it can be a talk. but then to be very frank i think lucin is something that i have loved and used it over my practice and definitely we have had good quality of the embryo so 
very difficult uh, even when i started prps it's like very difficult is it just the stimulation of the ovaries with the prick that is happening or is it the leucine or is it really the prp very difficult but then doesn't mean that i'm using a prp i'm not putting them on any adjuvant so everything comes in a combination and then everything adds on to the quality of the uh, oocytes that we are obtaining Yeah, ma'am. We are also getting very good positive comments for this uh, leucine from uh, doctors throughout the country, ma'am. They are using this uh, leucine and they are getting good results. Ma definitely. Thank definitely. you, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. So ma'am, there are no other questions in the chat box, ma'am. So if you allow us, then we can end the webinar for today, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. If there is any question, we will be sending yes. it to your personal mail, lady, ma'am. Definitely. You just address on that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much for uh, uh, spending your valuable time with us. and uh, i would also like to thank the audience for their active participation ma'am thank you thank you one and all ma'am bye bye ma'am and we are looking for many more uh, interesting webinars with definitely you. we'll do that thank you ma'am thank you very much thank you so much ma'am thank you thank you that's it